that means is we're going to take a look at this truss, which is made up of five separate beams or members, and we're going to determine how much force is in each of these members. We're also going to figure out how much force there is by each of the supports. You'll notice there's a pin here and a roller there. While we're at it, we're going to go through and we're also going to find whether each member is in tension or compression. And we'll talk about exactly what that means as we get to it. So to begin the analysis of a truss, first what we need to do is determine the reaction forces by the supports. And when we say reaction forces, what we're talking about is the forces which the supports are exerting on the truss as a reaction to this 100 pound load which is acting on this truss. 100 pounds is trying to pull the entire truss downward. And so these two supports are having to keep the truss from moving. The whole point of this truss is to remain rigid and, and static. So these supports need to offset or balance out this downward load. In order to do this, we're going to look at this just like we would a static beam. And we're going to look at the sum of all torques around each of these points, point A and point D. So first we're going to look at all torques around point A, which are acting externally to the truss. And when I say external torques, really what I'm talking about is torques that come from external forces acting on the truss. Now there's three forces externally acting on this truss. The support here at A, the load here at C, and the force from this support at point D. Now we can make a pretty reasonable guess and say that the supports at A and D are both acting upward. We don't know how strong or large those forces are. We're simply going to call them the force at the pin and the force at the roller. Now, in order to understand how these supports work, we need to talk a little bit about what these supports are doing, what makes one a pin and the other a roller, and just how they're going to behave then we'll be able to work out the torques and that will lead us into solving for the forces in each member. There's different types of supports and they do different things when supporting a truss. Let's start with the pin here. A pin is really like a fulcrum or a pivot point. And what it does is it allows anything pinned to the pin to rotate around the pin. It's pretty nicely named. So what this will do is allow anything connected to this pin to rotate around this point right here. You can think of it like a fulcrum or you can think of it kind of like a hinge. So in this case, this entire truss is free to pivot around this point right here because that's pinned right there. What the pin does not allow is lateral motion of any object connected to it or vertical motion of any object connected to it. So this pin is going to keep the truss from moving horizontally and it's going to keep this side of the truss from moving vertically. Over here looking at the roller. A roller is really just kind of like a wheel. And what it does is it allows lateral movement of any object supported by that roller. It also allows rotation of any object supported by that roller. So this roller right here is going to allow this truss to move left and right, as well as rotate around this point D. What it will not allow is vertical movement of this side of the truss. Now, sometimes you'll see rollers shown differently. A roller connected like this to a wall as opposed to the floor will allow vertical motion as well as rotation, and it will not allow horizontal motion. Now that doesn't show up in this problem, but it's important to understand what these different types of supports do and the motion which they allow. Now that we understand what each of these supports do, we're gonna take a look at the forces by each of the supports, and that's gonna allow us to solve for the forces within each of the members of the truss. So our first step is to solve for the forces at each of the supports. First, I'm going to look at the sum of all forces and torques around the left pin. It seems odd that we would look at torque in order to solve for force, 
But that's exactly what we're going to do. The sum of all torques around this pin right here has to equal zero. Now you might be asking yourself, how are we going to get from torque to force? But remember, torque is radius times force times the sine of the angle between the radius vector and the force vector. And so by looking at different torques, which are acting on this truss, we're going to be able to determine the forces acting on the truss. Now, there's one, two, three external forces, and therefore three external torques acting on this truss. So we're going to start with this one right here. This force by the pin is acting at the pin. So when we want to talk about the torque by this force, it's really a little bit strange because this force is acting at a radius of zero. There's some unknown force, Fp, and the angle between these two can be any value because this value is zero. So the important thing to see here is the torque by the force by the pin at the pin is zero. And that's really important. And we'll see why in a minute. Moving on to the next force, we're going to have 100 pounds acting at a radius of 20. So our, according to our equation, the radius of 20 times a force of 100. And you'll notice this force is straight down, which means it's acting at a 90 degree angle to our radius vector. And woe is me, I have left out my arrows right there and right there. Don't tell my in-laws, they're both engineers. All right. So now we have this torque by the load around this point. And it seems still strange we're looking at torque, but I'll show you what we do with this in a minute. We're on to our last force, this unknown force, FR, the force by the roller. So this force by the roller is acting at a total radius of 40 away from this pin. Remember, we're looking at torques around the pin. So radius of 40 times our unknown FR. And again, this force is going to be directed upward, sine of 90. Now, you may be asking yourself, how do we know this isn't directed somewhat to the left or somewhat to the right? And remember, we have a roller right here. This roller has to be acting vertically. Okay, The roller does not provide any force laterally or horizontally. It can only act upward or downward. So we know whether this force is up or down, it has to be acting at a 90 degree angle to the radius vector. The reason we look at torque in all of this is because you'll notice in this entire equation, we only have our force by the roller. Now it's important to take a look at this and to understand signs when trying to solve for the force by the roller. Because if we go through and do this, we'll find that the force by the roller is equal to negative 50 pounds. And at first that implies that perhaps this force by the roller is downward. But you have to remember when we went through and worked out the torque by first the load this way, then our force by the roller that way, we never paid attention to or accounted for signs of torque. Now, in going through and writing this term right here, the torque by the load, we effectively established that clockwise around this pin is a positive direction. Now, you'll notice a reasonable guess is that the force by the roller is upward. That's going to produce a counterclockwise torque. And so what's happening when this comes out as a negative 50 pounds, really all that's doing is accounting for the fact that we didn't try to dictate which direction the torque was occurring here. Had we accounted for torque or guessed that torque was going to be counterclockwise at the roller, this would have come out as a 50 pounds. But what's important to understand here is that this force by the roller is going to 50 pounds upward. Now that we've figured out this force by the roller, we're going to figure out the force by the pin. Now you can go through and use Newton's first law and say, well, the sum of all forces vertically on this truss must be zero. 
And if there's 100 pounds downward and 50 pounds upward, this must be 50 pounds upward. And guess what? It is. But we're not just going to go ahead and assume that. In case we mess something up here, all right? it's true the two forces upward should equal the one force downward. But we're not just going to do a little bit of subtraction to solve for this. We're going to solve for this force by the pin independently of this result and then check it by looking at the sum of our forces vertically within the y-axis. So, looking at the sum of all torques around the roller. And again, I recognize it's strange. Why would we look around the roller if we're trying to solve for a force at the pin? But that's how we do this. The sum of all torques around the roller has to be zero. Otherwise, this truss is going to rotate, and that would be a bad thing. Unless we're building a drawbridge, which we're not. Let's start over here again, and we're going to have our force by the pin multiplied by the radius, that's 40, and this force by the pin is upward, so we're going to have sine of 90. Now, if we want to pay attention to signs in this, if earlier on we established that clockwise was a positive torque, this force by the pin acting at a radius of 40 would cause this entire truss to rotate clockwise. So our sign on the torque term is absolutely fine. This 100 pounds, however, you'll notice the 100 pounds is acting at a radius of 20, and that load is trying to cause the entire truss to rotate counterclockwise around point D. So if we go ahead and guess that this is going to be a negative value, or suppose, or say that this is, if we go ahead and say this is a negative torque, we're going to have a radius of 20 times one, a load of 100 pounds. Again, the sine of 90 degrees, because in this early problem, we're keeping all of our forces at nice, neat right angles to our main beam that we're dealing with here. Now, lastly, we have our force by the roller. The force by the roller is acting at a radius that is zero distance from the roller because the roller is acting at the roller. They're zero apart. So our radius is zero. Our force is 50, which we already found, but it doesn't matter what we found for a value here. That term is zero. And again, we're going to go through and find out that our force by the pin works out to be 50 pounds. And again, I don't want to get too caught up in the signs here. We just need to do a little bit of thinking here we'll find that the force by the pin is 50 pounds upward. Now it would be appropriate to take a look at the sum of all forces vertically acting on this truss. There are one, two, three external loads, and you'll notice the sum of all forces up is equal in magnitude to all of the forces down. So what this does is this tells us that these two values are probably correct, all right? There's very little likelihood that we made any sort of mistake here twice that would have caused these two to just happen to come out to be equal in magnitude to this. Now you will notice these two forces are split and that's because this entire truss is symmetric. The left half of this truss is doing the same thing that the right half of the truss is. Now I know there's a pin and a roller and so that makes them not quite identical at the supports, but because there are no horizontal loads on this truss, the pin and the roller are both doing the same thing. Later on, once we start putting horizontal loads at certain joints in these trusses, then the pin and the roller are going to be different, doing different things, but uh, future us are going to deal with that. That's not for today. All right, let's get back to what we came to do here, and that is to solve for the forces in each of these five members. Now, the fact of the matter is, despite what people will tell you about trusses, trusses are easy. They really are. It's just right triangle trig. The problem with this is organization. If you're organized and methodical in going through these trusses, they're easy. If you're the sort of person who's just scratching numbers off in the margin of the page, yeah, trusses are gonna be hard. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a way to organize all of the thoughts and the knowledge that you have 
about this trust as we go through and work our way through this trust. Because every trust is different. You can't always just say, we're going to start with this beam, then move to that beam, then move to that beam. Every trust is a little bit unique. These are just engineering Sudoku puzzles. That's all they are. So I'll show you how we do this. In order to analyze this truss and the forces within the members, we're going to set up a simple table. All right, anytime we analyze a truss, we have to start someplace. We don't know any of the forces in any of these beams, so we have to start someplace. Now, there are two places where we can begin, either the supports or at the load. Uh, sometimes it makes more sense to start in one place than the other. Here, we can actually do a little bit of whatever we want. There's, there's not really a wrong place to begin here. So we're gonna pick up the obvious beams first, and then we'll move around this and try to figure out what we can. Because like I said, this is a little bit of a Sudoku puzzle. Or really, our solution over here, as we're trying to go through, is a little bit of a Sudoku puzzle. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sum of all forces at each joint. And it's going to be important for us to keep track of the forces in each axis by each beam. Beam AB is going to have a force both in the x and y direction. Now, pretty simply, using the Pythagorean theorem, we can find the total force. We're also going to identify whether these beams are in tension or compression. So that's what we'll do here. All right, but this thing is just a big puzzle. So let's go through and take a look at this and see if we can't figure out some of the simpler beams first before we have to get down into the weeds with our, our right triangle trig. In order to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is look at the load. This load right here is directed straight downward. And you'll notice at joint C, there are three beams, AC, BC, and CD, which all come together at joint C. Now, if you remember, in a truss, the assumption we make is that all these joints are pinned. That is to say that the individual beams cannot exert torque on a joint. They can only pull or push on a joint. So this beam right here can only act vertically on this point. This beam CD can only act horizontally on this point. AC can only act horizontally on this point. These beams can only push or pull. They cannot twist. So there's some ramifications of that concept and they show up here in the math. BC can only act vertically and that tells us that the force by BC in the x-axis is zero. There is no force by BC in the x-axis. Likewise, AC and CD can only act horizontally. That means they have no vertical forces. So when we look at joint C, in the vertical axis, we have 100 pounds downward, and we have BC upward. Or at least, we're assuming BC is upward. Something has to be acting against the load here. It can't be AC, it can't be CD. If we want to write this out as a bit of algebra, we would say that the sum of all forces at point C in the y-axis is zero. That is the result of AC in the y-axis plus BC in the y-axis plus CD in the y-axis. Then lastly, we have this 100 pound load downward. Well, we've already determined that AC vertically is zero. We've determined that CD vertically is zero. And so this pretty quickly leads us to the idea that BC in the y-axis is 100. So we fill that in in our table. Well, if the horizontal component 
of BC is zero, and the vertical component is 100, that means the total force in BC is 100. Let's go through and decide whether or not BC is in tension, meaning it's pulling, or compression, meaning it's pushing at its ends. BC has to be acting upward on point, or joint, C here. That means it has to be pulling upward on this joint. Now, whatever a member does at one end, it has to be doing at the other end, just in the equal magnitude but opposite direction. So if we were to draw the forces in member BC at the two ends of the beam, this end that force is up, at this end that force is down. The beam is pulling these two points towards each other. A beam which is pulling is under tension. Now that we know beam BC, we can try to move on either looking at joint B or continuing to look at joint C. The problem is, by looking at C, we can't really figure out much because we don't know what's going on horizontally in either AC or CD. So horizontally, if we look at each beam as an unknown, we have two unknowns. So any equation we set up is not going to allow us to solve for two unknowns. We would need a system of equations for that. And, and that is not something we want to introduce into these basic trusses. We have a similar issue up here at B. If we look at B within the horizontal axis, we have AB and BD as unknowns. Likewise, in the vertical axis, we have AB and BD as unknowns. So C and B are two joints we don't want to look at right now. That's going to force us to look at one of the two supports. Because if we can't figure out what we need here, we'll look elsewhere. Like I said, it's a Sudoku puzzle. So what we're going to do is look over here at joint A. We know at joint A, the sum of all forces vertically has to be zero. Sum of all forces at A in the y-axis needs to equal zero. And by happening to look in the y-axis, we can figure out a great deal here. There's only two things acting vertically at point A. The support, the pin, we know that's pushing upward with a force of 50 pounds, and member AB is also acting vertically. We know that because AB is a member which is running both in the horizontal and vertical axes. Now, yes, AC is tied into the pin here, but it's a horizontal beam, which means it can't have any force vertically. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sum of all of those forces in the y-axis. So, upward, we have the force by the pin. It's going to be 50 pounds upward. Plus, we're going to have AB in the y-axis plus AC in the y-axis. Now, we already established that AC in the y-axis is zero. Doing a quick little bit of math here, we find that AB in the y-axis is going to have to be negative 50 pounds. Now, let's think about what this negative 50 means, because the negative is important. I know earlier on here, these negatives, we kind of glossed over and then thought about it a little bit at the end, but let's think about what these negative 50 pounds mean. What it means is that whatever AB is doing, it has to be acting with some amount of force that is downward. There's no way AB can be pulling up into the right and be acting downward. The fact is, AB is actually acting this way, and its vertical component is 50 pounds. Now, if we do a little bit of trig, knowing the height of this truss is 15, uh, looking at the base of the left half of the truss is 20, the inverse tangent will give us an angle here of 36.9 degrees. Knowing that angle, 36.9 degrees, is the same as this angle right here, we can go through and solve for the force in beam AB. If this is 50, 
we're solving for the hypotenuse here, knowing the angle. So 50 over the sine of 36.9 is going to give us the hypotenuse, or the total force in AB, and we'll find that's 83.3. So we'll fill this in on our table here, 83.3. This beam has to be pushing. If the beam was pulling, the force at the end would be acting toward the center of the beam. It's pushing outward. So what that means is this beam AB is in compression. When a beam pulls on its ends inwards, it's in tension. When it pushes outward, it's in compression. So we know the magnitude of force in AB and BC. Now, let's go through and try to solve for the force in AC. In order to do that, what we're going to look at is the sum of all forces horizontally on the pin. So the sum of all forces at point A in the x direction. Now we know that this pin right here is not moving horizontally. We also know there are no external horizontal forces acting on this truss. So we know the pin itself is not acting horizontally on point A. So the sum of all forces at A in the x direction is zero. This point isn't moving. This always is going to be static. You're always going to find at any joint in any axis, this sum of all forces has to be zero. So we're going to look at the horizontal components of forces by all three things acting at A, the pin, AC, and AB. Now, we know the pin is not acting horizontally at point A. There's a force by AC in the x-axis, which we're trying to solve for. And there's a force by AB in the x-axis. Now, all these have to add up to zero. Now, we can see here pretty quickly that AC and AB horizontally are fighting each other. So we're going to say one of them is negative. Because AB is acting down and to the left, I'm going to say its horizontal component is negative. Sticking with a convention that up and to the right are going to be positive when we're dealing with forces. That doesn't apply to torques, so be careful there. If we can solve for ABX up here, we can solve for ACX, which is in fact just AC. That's obviously going to be useful. So, knowing the angle and the magnitude of force in AB, or knowing the magnitude of force and the opposite sign, we can use Pythagorean theorem. You decide whether you want to use the Pythagorean theorem or, or cosine, whatever's up to you. Uh, but we go through and we can solve for F in the X direction. We find that it's 66.7 pounds. So if AB in the X direction is 66.7 pounds to the left, make that negative. That means AC is going to have to be 66.7 pounds at joint A to the right. So here we find AC in the X is 66.7 pounds. Well, if this beam AC is only acting horizontally, that means the total force is 66.7. Now to get back to our discussion of tension versus compression, AC has to be acting to the right on point A. That means AC has to be pulling, which means it's under tension. We can perform similar calculations by looking at point D to determine the forces in BD and CD. Okay, so what we've done here is we've gone through and looked at the sum of all forces in particular axes at particular joints to work our way through us. Now realize we're not always going to do every single truss in the same exact order. This is an analytical process.
This is not simply a pattern that you memorize. So you have to be a little bit careful as you go through these. This is a skill. And like I said, this is easy once you learn the skill. It's like riding a bicycle. It's easy to people who can do it, but you're probably going to fall down and skin a knee or elbow on, on your, your journey to learning how to do this. Okay, so it takes practice. Now, one thing worth pointing out here is as I went through this, I was putting in positive and negative values on some of these. Uh, and and it's, it's a little bit interesting in how the math works out. It helps us figure out direction. But there's one thing of note. The fact is, these directions with positives and negatives really don't help us much. And here's why. AB in the X direction was to the left at this end of the beam. But if we were to look at this end of the beam, AB would be to the right. Because remember, going back to what we've seen before, the forces on opposite ends of the beam are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So AB horizontally was to the right here, vertically it was up as opposed to down and to the left over here. So to treat these as positive versus negative can be a little bit misleading because when we look at a single point, it has a direction. But looking at both points together, they're in opposite directions. We would say these forces are internal to the truss. The force here cancels out the force there. That's why we only had three external forces. If we draw in our forces from BD, see they do this. CD, under tension, was acting like this. Now, the nice thing about a truss is you can always go through and figure out if you screwed up. All right, there's no reason to ever do a truss wrong, to turn in a truss wrong to a teacher or anything like that, because you can always check it. And I'm gonna check it right here at B, where everything we did from the left meets up with everything we did from the right. And we find here that everything we did on the left shows that the force by AB is 50 pounds upward and 66.7 pounds to the left, or sorry, to the right. BD, had a magnitude of 50 pounds vertically and 66.7 pounds to the left. Now we know the sum of all forces on this joint right here has to be zero. You'll see horizontally, BD and AB are canceling each other out. Vertically, they're both adding together to be 100 pounds vertically, which are canceling out the 100 pounds downward by BC. So by working from the two edges of the truss inward, we're able to get to this point right here where we can check all of our work. And we know with absolute certainty that our values here are in fact correct. And that is how we solve a basic truss using what's called the method of joints. That's all for now.